Um, we'll call the uh, September 14th Public Safety Commission meeting to order. It's at 8.33 a.m. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got um, Commissioner Lamb, Commissioner Donnelly, Commissioner Kung, uh, Commissioner Osroff, and Commissioner Ehrlich. Um, the only one missing is uh, Commissioner Cal, and I believe she will be joining us at our next uh, meeting. So she'll be coming back. Um, so do we have any uh, general public comment before we get started? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we do. We received three general public comments. Okay. And uh, with your permission, I can go ahead and uh, yeah. read those for the record. Go ahead, please. Thank you. The first public comment is from Sally Kilby and Dean Sterwin for the South Pasadena Yes on Measure U 2020 Committee. And the public comment is, the South Pasadena Yes on Measure U Committee strongly urges your support to renew the utility users tax at the November 3rd general election. For nearly 40 years, we have relied upon stable, locally controlled funding from a UUT that provides $3.4 million annually. This second largest source of funds for the city constitutes 12% of the general fund. Revenues are distributed among city departments, including public safety, to provide vital city services. The UUT has been cons consistently renewed by voters. There is one crucial difference with renewing, renewing it at this time, however. Pandemic-related losses are devastating the city financially. Now more than ever, renewing the UUT is a way to maintain South Pasadena's basic services. In the future, if the tax is no longer needed, a majority of voters can make that determination and repeal it. We want South Pasadena to be able to respond to residents, including one, maintaining rapid 911 emergency response times, two, preserving firefighter and paramedic services, three, funding community, family, youth, senior, and library programs, four, keeping city streets and sidewalks in good repair, five, supporting crime prevention and neighborhood safety, six, keeping parks and public areas safe and clean. We look forward to your support for this ballot measure and invite you to join us in voting yes to renew the UUT November 3rd. To participate by donating, endorsing, volunteering, and requesting a lawn sign, visit our website at www.southpassyesonyou.com. Next public comment is from John Cerbellas. And Mr. Cerbellas uh, submitted a public comment on behalf of uh, Care First South Pasadena. Our jails are filled with people struggling with poverty, mental health needs, and homelessness. Far too many people enter the criminal justice system instead of getting the resources they need to avoid contact with the system in the first place. We have seen routine contacts with law enforcement escalate into tragedies, taking a disproportionate number of black lives. It is time for a new vision of public safety, one centered on health solutions and services provided in the community so that police intervention is the last option rather than the first and only response. Here in South Pasadena, we support a care first approach that reallocates resources from jails and law enforcement to programs that promote health, safety and welfare of communities. We demand that our city leaders adopt the priorities of a care first approach as developed by the Los Angeles County Work Group on alternatives to incarceration. It is, it is time to start realigning our city budget to support community services, not excessive levels of policing. The city is in a budget crisis. We demand a good faith minimum 15% cut to South Pasadena Police Department budget. Any expansion of the police budget should be halted. Below are our recommended immediate cuts to expenditures. One, we demand fewer police officers on the payroll. Wage and benefit expenses has increased by $1.2 million since 2016-17 while the crime rate has fallen. Total patrol staffing is out of proportion to patrol scheduling as reported in the SPPD's organizational chart. The SPPD owns 32 vehicles at an annual maintenance cost of $100,000. With fewer than 10 officers on patrol at any given moment, this, is, this expense is unjustified. We demand that some of these assets be sold and the SPPD implement bicycle patrolling where feasible as helicopter patrols are unpopular with residents and problematic in terms of privacy, noise, and carbon emissions. We demand that the, that the $30,000 contract 
with the Foothill Air Support Team be terminated. During this time, we request that the city enlist an independent audit of the SPPD. See City of Sebastopol. We look forward to working with you. We can be reached at Care First South Pasadena. Care First South Pass at gmail.com. And the last general public com comment is from Lawrence Abelson. On the Mobility and Transportation Infrastructure Commission, we hear and discuss at virtually every meeting concerns from the community involving speeding, failure to obey traffic control devices, traffic cutting through neighborhoods, and other traffic safety and management issues. Even with the recent formation of SPPD's Traffic Enforcement Bureau, the demand for enforcement greatly outweighs the supply. So the city's two speed feedback trailers have become important tools in managing speeds and SPPD's efforts in continuing to maintain, repair, and deploy them where needed is very much appreciated. One such area of concern happens to be my neighborhood, that is Columbia Street, Hermosa Street, and Grand Avenue between Orange Grove and Mission. These streets conveniently connect to create a convenient cut through in order to avoid the interruption and delay caused by the traffic and signals on Orange Grove at the 110 freeway. Hermosa Street is a local street which lies on a hill with a blind curve and virtually no sidewalks. So walkers, joggers, bikers, skateboarders, and drivers all have to share the road. Many drivers callously speed up and down the hill and cruise through the always stops at Hillside and Grand on a regular basis, particularly during weekday AM and PM peak hours, jeopardizing our safety. We sincerely appreciate when SPPD deploys resources in our neighborhood and look forward to continued regular enforcement as we await word from the Public Safety Works Department on more permanent solutions. And that concludes public comment. Um, thank you, City Clerk. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Snyder? I think we ought to uh, recognize and welcome um, Mayor Pro Tem Diana Mahmoud to our meeting today. There she is. Hello. Welcome, Diana. Thank you for joining us. Um, Jeremy, yeah. just a moment. I'd like to add to the um, care first uh, public comment. Uh, it was not mentioned that 128 people signed that uh, public comment. Okay. And that public comment was, was sent to us and um, it can, it, they usually do get posted as part of um, the agenda packet or, or the minutes. So people can see um, the names that are associated with those. Um, so uh, we have a lot on the agenda today. Um, I have another meeting um, at 1030. So I was wanted to see if we could reorder the agenda a little bit. Because um, I know that, you know, there's a lot of interest in certain items. So um, I'd like to propose that we start with agenda item four and then go to five and then uh, three, two, one if people have their agendas in front of them. Basically start with the ordinance revision, go to the police reform subcommittee, then COVID subcommittee, then the mandated inspection report, and then um, approve the minutes from our last meeting. Um, any objections to that? Everyone's okay with that? I'm okay. Okay, um, so the city attorney has a staff report to present on the public safety um, ordinance revision for agenda item number four. Thank you, Chair Ding. Um, I am here this morning as a resource to the commission, and I've also been asked to give the oral uh, staff report on this matter. Um, so this is a recommendation by staff uh, to amend the ordinance uh, governing the powers and duties of the Public Safety Commission. The last time that the ordinance was uh, amended to update your authority was, uh, I believe, uh, well, just a year ago, 2019. And uh, because of the renewed interest and focus on police policing and the community uh, does want to both have a better understanding of police policies and potential changes to those policies as well as more involvement uh, to this end staff is proposing some additional revisions to chapter two to do this 
Um, first up is a recommendation that the commission be comprised of five members rather than seven. Uh, for the purpose of greater efficiency, it's easier to form a quorum with less members and uh, that two of the members have a background in pub public safety. This was a uh, suggestion by the subcommittee that worked on this. Um, and if that gets approved, the way that that would happen is the present members of the public safety committee would serve out their current terms and then new appointments would eventually be made to five members uh, instead of seven after the expiration of the current term. So that's the way that that would work if that is uh, something that is um, uh, recommended and uh, also approved by the city council. Um, may I ask some, a brief question? Yes, you may. So you just mentioned you just mentioned a subcommittee. Who who's who's on the subcommittee that worked on subcommittee of city council members? I see. Um, then um, we the uh, suggested changes are modeled on the city of Claremont Police Commission, and the first thing I want to point out is that South Pasadena is a general law city. And as a general law city, it has to stay in its lane. It cannot exceed the authority granted to it by state statute. Um, where there is state statutory authority on particular areas and procedures, um, it, you cannot exceed that. A charter city can. It, a charter city can make its own rules as long as uh, they, um, are not, don't fall outside of matters of statewide concern. And that's a pretty broad area. But South Pasadena is a general law city, and so there are more legal restrictions on you. And uh, the, this is why the changes that are proposed are modeled on the city of Claremont Police Commission. Claremont is also a general law city. And uh, we're gonna go over quickly some of the examples of uh, revisions to your authority and the duties, which will include this commission acting as a forum for community discussion on public safety issues. So you would become a, a, a place where people can come and uh, share their concerns. And the commission, uh, as always, would have the power to make recommendations to the city council. And under these revisions also to the city manager, the police chief or the fire chief on police or fire issues. And the reason for that is the other thing that you, uh, in, in addition to being a general law city, South Pasadena is also a city manager council form of government. And uh, in a nutshell, what this means is that the city council, the legislative body sets all the policies and then the administrative staff, the operational staff acting through the city manager implements those policies. And again, the council and, none, and neither the council nor its subordinate uh, bodies can directly uh, direct the city manager or the operational staff. However, the, the revisions that are suggested here would allow the Public Safety Commission to make recommendations on operational matters, which is more than, you know, more than the authority you presently have. Um, so just to kind of cover, uh, I've summarized them in the staff report. The revisions would allow uh, a, uh, you to review and comment on police and fire policies, procedures, and practices. As I mentioned, the uh, commission would become a forum to hear community concerns, complaints, and also commendations regarding the police department and the fire department for that matter. You would receive reports on progress or conclusions of department investigations whenever legally possible. And I'm gonna tell you that that is going to be very restricted because of statutory authority. Uh, basically anything outside of SB 1421 is you are, no one can um, review internal department personnel investigations uh, outside of what SB 1421 permits. 
and uh, it would also allow you to review and comment on to receive annual reports from the chief of police and the fire chief regarding their best practices and that would include reports on recruitment and training programs and you would you and the community would be able to review and comment on this um, the you could also receive quarterly updates from um, the chief of police on customer service programs community orienting police programs you'd receive quarterly reports on crime trends and statistics and any pre, uh, crime prevention programs and have the authority to review and comment and uh, um, and of course, with the, the authority to review and comment is always the authority to make recommendations to the city council for potential changes in policy. You would also be able to receive um, data on, that. this is data that the police department keeps on police stops, arrests, citations, field interview cards, and police logs. So you would receive reports on that and um, obviously it can comment on that and uh, any other types of uh, matters that we refer to the commission by the council, the city manager or the police chief would be within your your purview. Um, we also clarified we removed from the commission's purview analysis of traffic and pedestrian safety and also code enforcement because there are two other commissions that um, that these things fall within and uh, it, it for purposes of avoiding duplication of efforts. Uh, but we have also highlighted that the commission would review and analyze emergency preparedness plans and services. Um, and then um, a suggestion for some additional training for commission members to in order to implement all of these suggested changes there is a uh, it would be a requirement for within 90 days of appointment that commission members receive a ride along training session with a member of the police department and then that would be repeated uh, annually and there would be a also a training with the police department's use of force simulator and uh, i think that um that is the end of the presentation on the staff report, but I'm happy to try to answer any of your questions. Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, I have my, uh, my copy of Rosenberg's rules here. So um, does anyone on the commission have any technical questions or clarification for the city attorney? You know, can we take public comment? Yeah, that's the next step. Um, nobody else has questions or clarifications for the city attorney? Ed? Um, Terry, does, does this draft incorporate all of the recommendations that the commission made? It does not. Your, your original draft um, it suffered from, um, unintentionally of course, from uh, several areas that would have been violative of the law in several different ways. Um, the suggestions to get more involved in the, um, the uh, citizen complaints and have some say in that would violate specific sections of the penal code. There's actually penal code sections directly on point that govern how police um, uh, go govern um, public complaints to the police department and there are, it's, there are very specific statutes on how those, that procedure is handled. And uh, specifically, um, well, one of the things is unless the matter is actually sustained, um, it, it doesn't even stay in the police, um, in uh, the police personnel file. All of those things are considered police personnel documents and are confidential because of it. So that was one area. There were also areas of your original suggestion, um, your original uh, document, which I think you called a charter document, that would be inconsistent with the uh, city manager, city council form of government and potentially um, 
uh, go outside of what the general law city um, constraints are. Uh, additionally, there were some concerns about some of the things that you might have suggested would require meet and confer with the police union and the fire union um, in order to even implement, like we could not even uh, adopt these things without prior meet and confer. Otherwise it would violate the Myers Milius Brown Act. So there were a number of concerns. So what uh, was done instead with the, with the uh, city council subcommittee was to take your document and try to put, give you as much as possible as, as we could. Uh, and so it appeared that the city of Claremont um, uh, police commission appeared to be the model. It was uh, close in um, this, uh, when we reviewed it. And so we took that instead and uh, tried to put as much back into it, but it's it basically tracks the city of Claremont model. And so that's that's what was done. And if you have questions on specific sections of what you was originally suggested as to why we couldn't implement it, um, I would try to answer them, but that's an overview of of why. Uh, rather than to do a gut and amend, so to speak, of your document, it was just easier to try to pull the concepts from your document and insert into the format of uh, the ordinance. And that's, that's what we have done here. The only aspects of the uh, redlined ordinance that you have before you that, that are not required by law, they're just a policy suggestion from the um, subcommittee is the uh, change in the commission from five member from seven members to five members that that's not a legal issue. Um, but I, as I said, the reasons for why the city may wish to go from seven to five is it's easier to form a quorum. And uh, also, if you have only five members, there is the strong uh, desire for at least two of the members to have a background in public safety, since you will be having so much review and comment and input into various sub public safety policies. If, um, if we were unable to find two uh, residents who had a law enforcement background to serve, would those two seats then just remain vacant? they would um yes i'm afraid so i mean that would be a requirement that if you went to a five member commission you two two of those seats would have to be have background in public safety the way that this is drafted and until you had those two seats you would only have three members so it, that, it's, that's correct it's very likely then that this would become a three-member commission well, one would hope not. Um, say saying a background in public safety, that's very, very broad. That could be police, that could be fire. It doesn't have to be local public safety. So that's very broad. Um, even given, uh, members given the, of- Given that very few of our local uh, first responders live here, we have a pretty limited population of residents to, to pull from. Yeah, it, well, I can't, that I cannot speak to. But public safety, someone with a background in public safety includes anybody who's ever worked in the district attorney's office, um, any uh, federal um, experience, county sheriff, it's not just local. It doesn't mean no, I understand background. That. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Snyder, you wanted to add something? Yeah, why don't we consider uh, keeping it a seven member commission? And then if you had two unfilled seats, you'd still have five members to, to the commission. Well, I wanted to add also, um, the, Terry, the language is at least two of the five members should have a background in public safety. Um, and I would think that if um, the intent was to make it mandatory, it would be must or shall rather than should. I, I would also note that there's only two of the, I think it's it's either 12 or 14 commissions that we have that have seven members, this one 
and NREC. Um, having served as a liaison to a number of commissions, I do think it the commissions function more easily with um, five rather than seven members. But I, I don't think you would, I, I don't think there would be a, a requirement that that there would be, I don't think the result would be a three member commission if there aren't sufficient applicants with the background in public safety, given that the word should rather than must or shall is, uh, is used. Mayor Pro Tem is correct. It has been drafted broadly enough to uh, to allow that. Um, I, I would imagine that the city would take the time that it would like to take. Uh, it could be more time to, uh, if assuming this is adopted, to look for members of uh, people of in, who are interested in serving who also have a background in public safety. But Mayor Pro Tem is correct. It's in, it's drafted as uh, not as a mandate, but as a um, uh, something desirable. Alan and then I mean. uh, Terry, uh, there, there are a number of cities that uh, where their uh, public safety commissions or their police commissions do have um more direct oversight over um personnel <clears throat> and complaint issues so you you mentioned that there's some state law um could you get us copies of what that state law is um sure um it actually i mean i can tell you it's uh, penal code section 832.5 and penal code section 832.7 uh, specifically. And, um, it, and, and it may be that the cities that you are thinking of, because I know what I, I know of a few as well, they are largely, well, it, in my um, experience, they are charter cities. And as I said, a charter city has much greater authority to set its own rules as long as those rules are not inconsistent with matters of statewide concern. Uh, and a general law city simply does not have that authority. Okay, I would um, still ask that you uh, make available copies of PC 832.5 and .7. That Happy to can do be, so. That can be uploaded as additional documents uh, for the public as well as for the commissioners. Uh, I'll note that none of the other commissions in the city have a requirement that members must have a specific background in order to serve on that commission. Uh, to Diana's point, there's a, a, a preference, if you will, that they may or shall have specific experience uh, but there's no requirement that it it's a must. And given a number of comments that we've heard from community members in the last several months, I would be quite opposed to reducing the commission from seven to five. Uh, one, I don't think we've had a problem getting a quorum with seven members. And two, the community is asking for more accountability, not less. And if we go from seven to five, that sounds like less accountability to me. Thank you. Uh, I mean, um, thank you. I, I I have a couple of comments. One, um, just just to kind of circle out this issue of public safety background. How how would you would it be defined, and who would be defining what a public safety background is? for purposes of serving on the commission? It, it could be defined in the application form and it would be defined as broadly as possible. But it wouldn't be defined in the, in the statute, it would be or in the charter, it would be staff Correct. or somebody would ultimately figure out some kind of definition that would be consistent. That that's correct, and in in the application form, and uh, certainly, 
um, staff could have examples of the application form to be reviewed by your commission before they were finalized and used. You, okay. you could certainly have input in, into that. It's an administrative function of staff in carrying out the new policy, but um, the, the goal is to have a, a, a document, an application form that serves the intended purpose. So I would see no legal constraints in having staff uh, receive input from the commission regarding the application form for uh, its members. Okay, I, look, from, a, from a substantive standpoint, it seems to me that having a public safety background would be somewhat limiting, certainly in terms of who the pool of applicants would be, but also I think in terms of the, the nature and quality of the um, input that would be received by from the community into public safety matters. And I think that certainly in conjunction with you know, this specific training, which uh, I think is, is you know, it's somehow, it, it seems sort of interesting and limited to that the training that's being required is training that's geared towards certain things rather than other things. Um, police rather than fire, certain aspects of police practice versus others, that sort of thing. That seems to me to be um, frankly, a little bit troubling that that's, that would be required of commission members. Certainly, I, I think there's value in, co in commission members learning about the practice of both and all of the departments that it uh, has relationships with or that it interacts with. I, I, I don't see any issue with that at all, but I think requiring certain things over others um, is problematic and I think we're probably going to hear from the community. I think that's probably going to be some an area of concern. Um, I, I also wanted to ask about subsection I. Um, that's come up a number of times and I don't and, and I may be missing something. I may have missed this and I wasn't at the last meeting but can you give some background on why the Public Safety Commission's charter has subsection I, I believe it's subsection I, whereas others do not. Where uh, I mean, uh, one second. Um, City Clerk, yeah. can I share my screen, please? Uh, before, and Terry can answer the question. Yes, just a minute. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Terry. Am I waiting to see something on the screen? Oh, there we go. I just wanted people to be able to see it. You can go ahead. Oh, okay. This this is already in your ordinance. I I didn't I didn't draft this or make any changes to it. This right. well, everywhere where you we, see. Oh, go, go ahead. Well, the reason the reason I bring it up is because I, I believe we took it out in our version, um, and it came back into this version. So. I guess setting aside, you know, the fact that it was it was put back, but I'm curious what the background of this is and why this exists for ours versus any others. Every commissioner, every commission has some limitations drafted into its uh, authority statement, and so this and as i say this was already in your ordinance and so i didn't delete it draft it um it it, it wasn't part of what the subcommittee rick uh looked at so this is simply a whoops let me go back and look at it again oh, sorry. um i'm having issues that's okay i i can i can go to the um go to my uh, copy out of the agenda packet as well. So what this is telling you is that as a commission, you can propose additional things, um, but you it can, but only to the extent that um, 
that uh, the city council directs or the city manager, remembering again, that council city manager form of government. And commissioner communications and requests of city staff have to go through the city manager's office. That's probably duplicative, it, um, I'm, you know, in response to your question about why this is in there. That I think is duplicative of the new um, policy of conduct and ethics. And so it, it, that statement probably doesn't even need to be in there anymore because it's already, not only is this consistent with council manager form of government, but there's already another document. It's a policy document that says the same thing. So I don't disagree with you that this whole sentence, the commissioner communications and requests of city staff must be made via the city manager's office, et cetera, et cetera, that that could easily be stricken because we already have another document stating it. Uh, basically, this section is just a restatement of law regarding council um, city manager form of government. And uh, if you wanted to delete it entirely, I wouldn't have any um, issues with that uh, from a legal perspective at all. I guess I guess that actually kind of flows to my, my next comment, which is in terms of process, I understand the direction that you took in terms of looking at what our document was, seeing that there may have been some inconsistencies with state law uh, and then just going ahead and, and wholesale doing another revision to the document separately and apart from what we did. Um, but I think it, it gets to the, a sort of a, an issue that caused me some concern when I saw this document and I'm sure it caused others uh, as well, which is that essentially our changes were set aside. That we came up with, and we spent a lot of time coming up with a document that we thought was uh, appropriate and we thought was worth presenting to the to the council um and then rather than taking that document and even even doing what you said you did behind the scenes but with us would have been helpful in the staff report which is saying here's here's what you guys said you know section f is conflicts with this law section g conflicts with this law you know to see to kind of get a sense of what what happened, but instead we got a completely new document that ignored something that we took out that um, didn't provide us with background and added in a few things that were not consistent with what we wanted or what we proposed. Um, it's a, I think it's both a matter of substance and a matter of process um, that I found to be troubling. Um, and I would, I would echo Alan's comment. I would, you know, not just for those uh, penal code sections, but I would request a more fulsome um, analysis of what in our proposed charter was inconsistent with the law because uh, although some of it in substance was kept in, I think there were other pieces of it that were taken out that don't strike me as being conflicting of law. I'm not an expert in, you're obviously the expert in uh, public law, but I think it would be useful for us to know, and I think it would be useful for the public to know, um, at least in terms of the transparency of process. Ed? To, to follow on with what Amin just suggested, probably also be helpful to look at the existing document, the existing charter, and see if there are inconsistencies with state law there as well. Um, through the chair, uh, Jeremy, would you like me to respond to to that? To because I I do hear your concerns, and it was meant as no disrespect to the commission to um, pr take what you had and reinterpret it into a form that is consistent with the law and essentially tried and true by another uh, actual police commission in another general law city. Yeah. Uh, if you want, it was also the most um, expedient way to accomplish this consistent with my direction. Um, it, it essentially would take less uh, city attorney time than a gut and amend of your existing document. But if there's a, 
if there's a strong interest in seeing a red line version of your original document with an explanation on a blow by blow comment by comment basis of why as drafted it would be violative of the law um i can certainly do that but this is this, it, it can't happen at this meeting oh no yeah I, I don't think that was the request to have it done at this meeting but like for example um one of the things you mentioned was you know with regard to the police union and i was looking at the the two versions and you know there's the only area in the draft charter that talks about um let me actually share this it might be easier for people and all the documents that we've shared uh i've previously asked that they be included in the agenda packet or the minutes so that people can actually see them i know that the city clerk has actually gotten requests for them so these, these documents will be made available so um this is the draft that we sent up under section g um basically this is the exact same wording that was used in the version that uh staff had updated the only difference is and, and when you talk the reason why i bring this up is because you talk about having to confer with the police union and things like that so Section G is essentially the same. The only difference is we wrote unless prohibited by law and your version says, I believe, um, where legally permissible or, or something along those lines. So I think one of the reasons was is that um, the Public Safety Commission traditionally has been told you can't talk about this, you can't talk about that, you can't address this, you can't address that. And what we wanted to have a little bit more transparency and accountability in saying, okay, well, if you don't want us to talk about it, tell me why you can't. Because we're legally permissible and unless prohibited by law, there's some daylight in between there. Um, maybe not a lot, but there definitely is some, and we want more transparency, and that's what the community is asking for. So I I, I do know that you know we're not municipal attorneys. This is just a draft document. There are probably some legal inconsistencies and issues that that are in here. So I, I do think that it would be useful to know exactly where these things don't make sense or are not legally permissible. Uh, because I think by and large, it does have a lot of what was moved into the new draft. I think some of the concerns are the things like the required training and the reduction of the size of the commission and the retention of section I, which, um, you know, I guess you're saying that section I is basically already duplicated in the city ordinance. But when you look at that section I, it, it, it reads to me that um, we could spend months and months and hours and hours, which is what we're doing on the police reform front and we send it to the city manager's office and if the city manager simply doesn't like it or decides to exercise their discretion it'll never see the day of light with council is how it reads to me um and even some of the language in the staff edit version says that the commission may talk about this or may talk about that and you want to get into the granularity of legal speak with regard to should versus must versus shall may discuss these issues sounds to me like you know at the pleasure of staff uh which one of the reasons why we even brought this thing up is because we were constantly running into issues of saying here's an issue that's important to the community we would like to put it on the agenda and time after time we were told no you can't put that on your agenda so i think some of the language in ours is a little bit uh, more conducive to transparency such as you know um one of the edits was that we can talk about these things specifically and without limitation. So if it falls under the charter, it could be put on the agenda and it could be discussed. Not only if the city manager and the city attorney say it's okay for us to discuss. I think it's just about uh, transparency and independence. And I do actually have one question is that, is there any actual like quantitative backup to say that it's more efficient to have a five member commission versus a seven member commission? Because I can think of plenty of ways where having a seven member commission actually makes us more efficient and more likely to form quorum. Well, the only issue there, um, Chair Ding, is uh, the number of people that need to show up to your meeting to form a quorum. With a seven member commission, you have to have a minimum of four people. 
with a five member commission, you uh, need a minimum of three. And it's, it's just that simple. And as I say, the five versus seven, not really a legal issue. It's really up to the city how it wants to form the commission and, and, um, uh, and what the requirements are for composition. Not a legal issue for me. Um, I just picked these up because that was my direction. Um, I just think that it's, it's my feeling that that is like a deficient argument for making it a five member commission because I think, you know, um, statistically, that's actually an inaccurate statement. Um, if it, if I am, if I do happen to be wrong, it's such an insignificant difference. It doesn't even make a difference. So um, I would strongly recommend having seven. For example, um, we have a commissioner that's on maternity leave and she's been gone for several months. So that allows two other people to, you know, potentially be absent and us still being able to form a quorum. Uh, if we were a five member commission and we had a member on maternity leave for several months, you know, then then it, it really starts getting a little bit tighter. Only one other person can be can be absent. So um, I just don't think that's a valid argument. If, if there's other reasons why we should go to five versus seven, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. But I, I don't think it makes us more efficient. I, I think it decreases the amount of involvement from the community, which is the opposite direction of where we should be going. Um, but yeah, as I said, there are no there are no legal reasons and I'm not a policymaker, so I don't get down in the weeds and um, try to advise you on what your policy should be or shouldn't be. Okay. Uh, procedurally, once you get to a point where you are ready to recommend something and including whether your commission should stay at seven or go to five, um, procedurally, you would make that recommendation to in the form of a motion and uh, then staff would put that on the city council's agenda for consideration and potential action. So that's the way that that would be handled. It's it's not being stuffed down your throats, so to speak, and it's not a legal issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there's no more uh, technical questions or clarifications, um, can we go to public comment? Thank you, Chair. We received four public comments for this item. First public comment is from SP Youth. It's clear that SPPD and Police Chief Joe Ortiz see the Public Safety Commission through an incredibly patronizing lens. Sure, you want to deal with cop topics? Well, then you will also have to remove two members, put up incredibly unreasonable barriers, and more than 12 hours of stepping into our shoes. There are better ways of talking to commissioners. Why don't you start simply by asking? The draft displays a fundamental misunderstanding of how representative democracy should function. It would take too long to go through what is wrong with SPBD's version of the charter point by point. At a basic level, the PSC should not be filtered through the city manager and should operate at the behest of council. That's what a commission is. Why is there no mention made of the increasingly important topic that is homelessness? Why is there no ride along requirement with the fire department if they are equally housed under public safety? Why does section six pose policy police chief as equally determinant in the commission's work as council? We urge the PSC and city manager to bring both versions before council for a vote. It would be a shame if the outcome of this entire process were regression on the topic of police reform in South Pasadena. Next public comment is from Matthew Barbado. I am deeply opposed to the police department and city attorney's attempts to take control of the Public Safety Commission with their move to reduce its size, stack it with allies, and manipulate the charter to give themselves more power to control the outcome and mandates of the commission. Not only are these moves unethical, they are insulting to the residents of South Pasadena. In the wake of clear abuses of power, and prejudicial behavior by police departments across the nation, concerned citizens demanding change are encountering only indignation and obstruction from police departments. Police and their unions are dismissing our requests for more effective, less lethal policing with moves designed to expand their power and lessen their accountability. 
The timing of this move by the police department and city attorney's office is evidence enough that its purpose is to obstruct police reform and not, as they say, become more efficient. Any changes to the Public Safety Commission charter should only serve to expand transparency and influence by the community. Any attempts in opposition to this in the name of efficiency are a smokescreen to secure even less accountability. Next public comment is from Evelyn Zenheimer. My name is Evelyn Zenheimer, a woman of color from District 1, commenting on agenda item number four. First, I would like the commission to consist of seven members, men and women, people of color and someone with disabilities. We need a broad representation to ensure we have perspectives on different situations and how PD deals with different people. Our PD takes more than one third of the city's annual budget. Thus, it merits input from a diverse group, free from cronyism of city council members. Second, I don't think a background in public safety should be a requirement. While it could be a benefit to have a little bit of understanding, but it can also bias their opinions or provide their own justifications because they were used when they were in uniform. Third, I don't think ride-alongs should be required. If you are going to make people do a use of force training, then de-escalation training should be mandatory. The goal is to resolve issues and not use force. What we need to evaluate is how quickly our PD uses force. There should be a balance between policy training and de-escalation training. Fourth, PSC should be an independent advisory body free from the control of the city manager's office and should be able to provide direct recommendation to the city council. PSC should not be bound or subject to the police chief's directions. Otherwise, it defeats the true purpose of this commission. Last public comment is from Abel Lawrence Abelson. I am writing to express my concern regarding staff's proposed revised ordinance for the Public Safety Commission. The PSC should continue to have seven members. It handles some of the most critical high-profile issues for our city and involves the departments with the largest budgets and full-time employees. There is no demonstrated need for a reduction. Also, the background in public safety requirement is ambiguous, could hinder participation, and should be reduced to a recommendation. The ride-along and use-of-force simulator training requirements seems burdensome. While certainly beneficial and worthy of encouragement, they should be recommended only or lessened if required. Both police and fire should be included in the first paragraph and subdivisions 2 and 4 of section 2.3, subsection B. Section 2.43, subsection I, should be deleted in its entirety. Not only is it way too granular, but it seems to be an improper attempt to micromanage and handcuff the PSC. The PSC is the voice of the community on public safety issues. It should be allowed to communicate with staff and make requests and recommendations on these issues without being filtered through the city manager. I respectfully request that the draft revised ordinance, which the PSC forwarded to staff for review at its 7-13-20 meeting, be recommended for approval, excluding section 2.43, subsection H, as traffic and pedestrian safety and related issues are within the purview of and more properly addressed by the MTIC, of which I am a vice chair. Thank you. And that concludes public comment for agenda item number four. Uh, thank you very much, city clerk. Uh, let me see here. So after public comments, um, it says that we should invite a motion. Does anybody have a motion? I'll make a motion to reject the staff report. Um, can you clarify, like, just do you, you just want to reject it outright? Re rejected it its entirety. Um, what uh, would the follow-up be? Uh, there are a number of issues that we've already raised and discussed, so I don't think it would be an efficient use of the commission's time today to go through it, all of these items point by point. Um, a lot of the items which are being indicated as the commission will now be able to do this are things that we already do. Um, 
and, and given that our city manager just re retired uh, this past weekend and that uh, there will be at least two, if not three new city council members coming up in November. I, and that we just revised the charter at the beginning of this year, I think it would be premature to do any more charter revisions before a new city council is seated. Okay, um, is there a second? Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Um, well, uh, can I make a, if, if, does anyone else want to motion or otherwise I was gonna do a substitute motion. Um, I was gonna make a substitute motion that we, we and just piggyback on what Alan said, is that we um, reject the staff edits uh, as is, but that I do want staff to take a look at the um, version that the Public Safety Commission put forward so that we can get clarity on which sections would violate, um, you know, law, policy, regulations, and that we can continue this at our next meeting because um, as our current um, charter stands, we are extremely limited in what we can do. So um, I can restate the motion if, if there is a second in a more clear, I would, clear fashion. I would, second, I would second that motion. Okay, so um, according Chair Ding, to- yeah. Chair Ding, before you vote, um, I was part of the council uh, subcommittee that reviewed this, and I think it might be helpful to provide some background um, as a result of uh, the comments that I've heard. I've taken some notes. Sure. Um, the recommendation for training is that, or the requirement for training is that in order to, it, it, it's clear that the community wants to provide additional input on um, in particular, uh, the conduct of police. I haven't heard the same expression with regard to the conduct of the fire department, but um, certainly to the extent that there's a desire to um, expand training, that that would be fine. It would be up to the commission. But in order to provide recommendations, in order to expand and, and make more meaningful the authority that this commission wishes to um, exercise, I don't know why you wouldn't want to have more education that can only be provided by doing a, a ride along. Doing a ride along is quite um, standard uh, operating procedure for anybody that um, is in a position to to provide any sort of um, of understanding of what uh, police officers do day in and day out as part of their job. I would also note, um, I, I did a bit of research and um, as you probably know, um, in the San Gabriel Valley, there are a number of cities that utilize the, um, their public safety, excuse me, that, util that uh, contract with the LA County Sheriff's Department or procurement of their law enforcement, um, of their public safety within their jurisdiction. For those cities that have their own municipal department, and unfortunately, um, I'm having difficult, I'm having technical difficulties too, so I can't um, bring up the, the document that I um, prepared that I identifies exactly those agencies, but among them, they are the cities of Arcadia, Monrovia, San Marino, Alhambra, Monterey Park, and Claremont. Um, and of all of those cities, there are only two that have anything anywhere near. Um, San Marino has a public safety commission. They have their municipal code contains very generic language regarding what their commission can do. Um, Claremont has a far more detailed um, uh, provision. Other than that, there's basically nothing within the cities that have public safety departments. Um, so I, th and, and they are all general law cities. I, and of course I did um, forget to mention Pasadena, but Pasadena is a charter city. 
Um, it appeared to me that um, this proposed that the proposal that was forwarded by um, the uh, commission committee started with the city of Claremont's provisions. And I believe that what staff has recommended is essentially consistent with what Claremont already has with the possible exception that I think Claremont requires four hours of training and this um, requires eight hours. Other than that, I think it pretty well tracks the changes that are proposed, pretty well tracks what the city of Claremont has. And again, what the city of Claremont has is far and away the most detailed um, uh, discussion of the public safety. It's, it is called a police commission. Um, it's the most detailed description of citizen input into, um, into law enforcement or, or public safety considerations. Um, I would also note that, uh, you know, there's been quite a bit of discussion um, in the city of Pasadena regarding um, their proposal for some sort of citizen commission. And I, I believe that council recently took action to formulate that. But um, I believe that the city of Pasadena is requiring 30 hours of training. So I just wanted to provide you all with a background. What, and also, um, for example, in specific response to the language, unless prohibited by law, um, there are instances where it would not be prohibited by law for the commission to receive um, an update. However, um, because of liability concerns, it would not be in the city's interest to um, expand, to provide um, an update. Um, so that's an, an example of where, of a, of a substantive change that was made because of the potential concern of um, expanding city liability and um, just the law of unintended consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I, think, I think where you're getting some of the pushback on the um, required training is that we are actually, you know, we're not the police commission, we're the public safety commission. Um, a lot of the things that come up uh, during our regular meetings are you know, fire related, traffic related, um, public health, homeless, things like that. And we can, you know, if we got a commissioner with a great public health background or a great homeless background, um, they may not be very interested in, in participating in these police uh, focused activities. And so I think that's kind of where, I, I don't think anyone's saying that we shouldn't recommend it and, or even recommend it strongly. I think it's the requirement. Um, and as you've mentioned before, you know, um, we're all volunteers. Um, these meetings are on Monday at 8.30 a.m. We're already taking time out of our work, work days to do this and to throw an additional, you know, however many hours into our, our, our workload um, for, it, it's just, uh, it's something that should be recommended and, and not required. I, I think it's the general consensus. And I think with regard to um, what you were mentioning about the language of being able to discuss something uh, where legally permitted versus um, unless prohibited by law and to talk about liability. I think that's something that the community and the council need to balance as far as do we balance the potential expansion of legal liability versus transparency or versus the community's desire to know about something. Um, you know, there are some great examples of where people in the community feel maybe there should be a little bit more transparency and balancing of, well, this might create a tiny little bit of liability, but let's just shut people out for 18 months. Um, I think that's kind of what we've been hearing from the community. So um, yeah, I, yeah, thank you for those clarifications, but um, that's kind of where I feel like we came from. Um, I mean, and Grace for helping on this. Do you guys have anything to add or comment on? 
I guess I what I would add. Sorry, Grace, if you have, if you want to go ahead, I've already taken the time. Uh, I guess I, what I would add is is uh, I, I I understand and appreciate um, where you where you guys were coming from in terms of trying to to use, for example, Claremont as a model, um, adding in training because that's consistent with what others are doing and and with you know our our commission providing input informed input i 100 percent understand that um but it's become a i think a common theme and and i and i don't think that we are out of line for for being concerned about it that where something comes out of the commission it lands somewhere we're not quite sure where it lands with whether it lands with council or whether it lands with the city manager or, or wherever it gets changed. Um, in this case, it just seemed like it got ignored because it was it didn't address the comments that we made. And so, from a matter of pro from a from perspective of process, you know, it, it would be helpful for us to have a bit more of a transparent process and for us to know these sorts of things. But, for example, you know, and I think this came up in our discussion, so it would have probably been helpful to have council members who are involved in this process be a part of the discussions that we are having. Um, that we looked at a variety of different cities, not just Claremont, and we didn't model this only after Claremont. And in fact, in our subcommittee, we, we actually had the discussion and said, you know, we're, we're not Claremont and we're not a police commission. Um, we have a broader mandate. So we wanted to tailor our, our provisions to be more broadly applicable. Um, it, you know, this kind of dialogue is useful and it's helpful and maybe it would have been useful for us. At, you know, I don't know what the formality of this would have looked like, but for our subcommittee to have worked with the council subcommittee, for example, to have these, to have this be a more um, collaborative process. Um, the other, the other comment that I would make is, um, of course, I've lost my train of thought. So uh, I guess, I, I guess the, the, the concern also, I think is, um, well, I, I think I've, I sort of set it out, and, I, and if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll mention it. But, but that, that's sort of the, the comment that I wanted to make. I'd be happy to um, work with you if, if, if there's a, a desire yeah. to work together to, to provide some input. Because quite frankly, this is, um, as, as uh, Chair Ding um, mentioned, this is a balancing act. and. Um, as, as a council member, I'm trying to balance, you know, I'm looking at what other cities in our area are doing. And I don't know if anybody looked at the city of Los Angeles, for example, but particularly having been um, a, a um, deputy city attorney within the city of Los Angeles, which is a, a, a charter city. And obviously, you know, I think at this point, it's got a population of 4 million the resources um, that are available to the city of Los Angeles. It's just night and day, it's not comparable. So what I did was I looked at other comparable cities in our region to see what they were doing. And um, that was the, the basis for the recommendation. And what we're trying to do is to provide a balance. We understand that um, there is a, a desire to have greater citizen participation um, to provide for greater input into what's happening on public safety issues. And um, we need to balance that against um, what is still a fairly lean department that is among, and I forgot city of Sierra Madre also has its own police department, sorry, Chief. Um, but we have a very lean department and so, um, I can tell you there, there was some discussion of subsection I. I don't have um, any difficulty uh, recommending that that be eliminated. It was included because I think this commission was the most recent commission to have their, um, their applicable Unicode provisions reviewed. But the sentiment there was um, it was born out of the city manager's concern that sometimes commissions go off on their own and they direct staff to do stuff. And I believe the sense of the city manager at that time was, I can't 
I, I am responsible for what staff does. And so if a commission wants staff to do something, I have to approve it because to the extent that the commission is directing staff to do something, that has to be weighed um, in relation to everything else that staff has. And because we're a small city, um, the, the demands of staff is a really important consideration. Um, so the, I, I'm sorry I didn't address uh, subsection I before, but that was um, the reason for that. But to return, I would be, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to achieve a balance. We, I think I am committed to keeping a police department, but at the same time, it's important for our residents to recognize that our police officers are among the lowest paid officers in the region. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to be responsive to a request for more input while also keeping an environment in which the police feel that they are being respected. We're, we're trying to achieve a balance. And so when the, um, I did review what was proposed when it was so far beyond anything else that exists in the San Gabriel Valley. And again, the only two cities of all the cities that have um, any safety are the city of Claremont and the city of um, San Marino. Um, it was appropriate to dial it back. Also, for example, um, some of it, it's just too demanding on staff. The requirement that the um, police chief provide an annual report on homelessness uh, an oral um, summary, fine, but we really have to consider, we have a total of about, it's slightly less, 150 FTE to do everything within the city. Everything, soup to nuts. Well, Thank you. Um, the, that was actually added in there because that's already happening. The police chief already is providing an annual update on homeless outreach. So that was one area where we weren't placing additional demands, but rather capturing what was actually going on. Because as you, as you know, homelessness is actually not even in our current charter and it's been coming before us. So that was an addition that we made to capture what was the reality of the, the commission's business. But yeah, we were, I think the Public Safety Commission is pretty cognizant of staff resources and staff time. And I, I do think that um, some of the new, uh, things on there were put on in direct response to community expectations and community feedback. For example, um, I know we're getting a new CAD RMS system, which should help a lot with statistics, but I think that to your average community member that may not understand the ins and outs of this, they think it's unacceptable that we can't receive monthly statistics on police. That they, they think it's unacceptable that we cannot get monthly police statistics or quarterly police statistics or an annual report that doesn't take more than nine months to get that's just unacceptable to your average citizen. And that's why we're trying to have these things in place to make sure that the prior, the resources are allocated to at a minimum provide statistical reporting um, to our residents with regard to what our police and fire are doing. But um, we've talked about this for a really long time. So um, unless there's anyone else that wants to add anything, we do have a motion or, or, or two motions on the table. Um, is everyone comfortable with moving forward on that? Jeremy, I'd just like to add uh, two quick things. Um, first, the uh, councilwoman, Diana, there's always a preference that we work together. Um, that I don't see that as ever having been an issue. I am curious why you mentioned the sheriff's department twice in your comments. Um, is there, because I'm not aware of any discussions that we might uh, eliminate the South Pasadena police force. So I don't know why you're bringing up the sheriff's department. The reason I brought up the sheriff's department, this was a proposal that was um, made to, it was considered some years ago and it was highly controversial at the time, but quite frankly, um, 
unless the UUT passes, I don't know that we would have a choice other than to go to the Sheriff's Department because we simply won't have enough money to host our own police department. Okay, so that's a UUT discussion. That's not a PSC discussion. I, I, I'm, I just made reference to it um, because that is the alternative and, and if the UUT doesn't pass, unfortunately, I think that will be something the city will have to consider. That was the only, it, it, it's also just because as I was explaining, either you have your own municipal department or you rely on the sheriff. If you rely on the sheriff, you obviously have even less input into, um, there's even less local control. Um, and I am, um, as a council member, I am committed to having our own police department because I think to not have our own police department would um, diminish the quality of life in our city. But again, this is a balance. And as I said, right now, because of limited funds, our police are um, among the lowest paid. I think there's one other police department that might pay less than we do in the region of all the ones that I mentioned. Um, and if we, so it, it just goes to the environment in which the police work. Okay, thank you. Um, so I made a motion that um, we reject the current um, ordinance revision provided by staff and that we request a more, um, we would that, and that we request that the version that was put forward by the Public Safety Commission receive um, another look with, you know, clarification on which areas are permitted, not permitted, undesirable, unwanted, uh, et cetera. And Amin had seconded that motion. Um, um, everyone in favor? Can you raise your hand and say aye? Okay. Um, that is everyone that's present. Um, no abstentions. Nobody says no. Speak now. Okay. So that motion passed. And I would like to make another motion that appoints uh, Amin and Grace to um, work with the council subcommittee on and, and the city attorney's office on working through uh, potential revisions and changes to the um, Public Safety Commission Charter. Second, anybody? Second that. Okay. Um, Ed uh, seconds that, and uh, everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, everybody, that's everyone. Uh, no abstentions, no uh, against. Okay. All right. Um, moving on to the next topic. Sorry, that took so long. Um, topic five is uh, Police Reform Subcommittee, uh, Commissioner Lamb and Commissioner Donnelly. <laughs> Okay, um, we, uh, the subcommittee actually met with, we heard concerns from the, uh, the community, police interest groups, police employees. We even talked with former committee members uh, with law enforcement background on looking at, uh, we actually looked at the, the primary uh, push for police reform, uh, which is the eight weight issues. Um, so what I'm about to present to you is uh, an analysis of uh, the current policy that the police department has versus, and then we looked at um, the updated policy that they're looking at. Um, and then we looked at the, uh, and then we came up with our recommendations. Now keep in mind, this is just a draft. We're still uh, having active discussions we have discussions uh, with the police department with and with city council. I'm going to share my screen. Ed, do you want to add anything at this point? No, I, I think your analysis covers everything, Scott. Okay, so this, and I'm going to share the screen and uh, oh, our screen's open. Um, let's see. Did that work? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it works. Okay, so um, the eight can't wait issues, uh, there are eight of them, and I'm just gonna go through them one by one. 
And what it is, is it is a push by uh, for police reform. And they looked at eight specific issues. And so what I did was I had this spreadsheet over here, which you can see my mouse as I'm moving around. Is that correct? Yeah, we can see your mouse. And also, um, if you can make this spreadsheet available to the city clerk, they can make sure it gets publicly posted. OK. Uh, this is the draft. This is the current draft. It hasn't changed from the ones that you guys have seen before. Uh, the first issue is the um, ban chokeholds. Um, we looked at the this is the the policy as they this is how eight can't wait. This is just a cut and paste from eight can't wait. The eight can't wait website. Uh, this column is the current policy. This column is the policy, the draft policy that South Pasadena uses a company called Lesipol uh, to come up with their new policy. And they looked at what's going on currently. Uh, and then uh, what I did was, or what we did as a committee, as a subcommittee, we looked at, we analyzed the current policy versus the updated potential policy. And then we came up with a recommendation uh, regarding this first issue of banning chokeholds. Um, oh, Scott, to clarify, these recommendations are coming from the Public Safety Commission subcommittee. Correct. Not um, not to be confused with the council subcommittee. The council has their own subcommittee and we meet with them as well uh, together. These are the recommendations of, of the, this subcommittee. Of this. Uh, so um, just letting you know, this, these are comments and recommendations and this is what's kind of happening. Um, on 6-4, uh, it was a, a bill was introduced to just eliminate uh, the training of, of putting a training of the carotid control hold. On 6-7, the internal memo within the South Pasadena Police Department was put out that completely disallowed the use of carotid control hold. Um, and then uh, in July, the updated Lexapol draft still has it in there. Actually, we've always had it in there. Uh, so as of this date, the it is uh, the carotid control is not allowed. Um, this, we looked at, we, we as a committee, uh, as a subcommittee decided that it is better to have this control hold in there than using deadly force. So that's the recommendation from the subcommittee that it's better to leave it in there because as an alternative deadly force. We, uh, I'm just going to go through these fairly quickly for time. The second one was to require de-escalation. Uh, we already have it in our policy, in South Pasadena policy. Uh, in the updated policy, it just clarifies that de-escalation should be used at all times. And the commission subcommittee so recommends accepting the updated policy. Require warning before shooting. Uh, the uh, current policy has a requirement where feasible, the officer should should give a warning. Um, in the updated policy, what they did was just they brought this thing, which and not that it's an afterthought. It's, it's it's in here, but they just brought it up to the top uh, on the updated policy. So to just to emphasize how important it is. So uh, the commission, the subcommittee uh, recommends accepting the updated policy. Regarding the uh, requirement to exhaust all alternatives before shooting, there's no, there's nothing in the policy that, that states it word for word that you have to exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Um, we felt that it was very difficult to apply when you're, when you're faced with a situation where you re really need to make a, a quick decision but you have you can't go through like listing things going through a list of things that you have to do before you shoot um the south pass the policy already includes um a number of uh sections where they uh that they can't shoot unless they have to evaluate everything uh, very specifically you can see the policy numbers, and uh, I'm just going to go through them really quickly. 
already requires an officer to evaluate the other options when safe and feasible. So it's, it's kind of like this, but it doesn't look at it word for word. Um, already allows the officer to use the amount of force reasonably necessary. And then the, the policy of the South Pasadena Police Department is to use, is to use the minimum amount of force necessary um, to control the subject. The commission, the subcommittee does not recommend any changes to the current policy and accepting the updated policy. Regarding duty to intervene, it's already in the policy that you have to intervene. The, the updated policy actually expands on that. For some reason, the original policy um, leaves out that if you see another employee, if an officer sees another employee uh, using excessive force, it wasn't in there. So now it actually includes everything. If an officer, uh, the law enforcement or an employee sees another officer, or actually if a, if a officer sees another employee or another officer using excessive force, they, can, they need to intervene when it's, um, when it's, uh, when they can uh, reasonably break and, and, and uh, intervene. Uh, so the policy is good and the new updated policy, we like it. So we're going to uh, uh, recommend accepting the updated policy. Ban it shooting at moving vehicles. This one uh, in the South Pasadena policy, um, they didn't change anything on this one, by the way. Um, the South Pasadena policy right now, there's very rare instances that you could use it. It's um, that South Pasadena, the police department recognizes in the policy that it's generally ineffective, but in extreme circumstances, they can do it. And we believe that there may be extreme circumstances that you can shoot at a moving vehicle. Um, you have to take into account everything. You have to take into account the collateral damage. You have to take into account um, the totality of the circumstances. Uh, but to completely eliminate the, to, to completely say that you cannot do it no matter what, we did not believe was uh, a good idea. So we recommend keeping the policy the way it is. Um, there was an inconsistency, which I mentioned, um, but uh, in general, it basically keeping the policy the way it is, or you can shoot at a moving vehicle in extreme circumstances. Uh, require use of force continuum. It's really just the wording use of force continuum. We have something in effect um, where we don't, we don't use this word use of force continuum. I don't think it's been used in law enforcement policy or training in a long time. Um, I made mention to that in the comments and recommendations. Um, they when faced with a, a situation that requires potentially deadly force, the officer can pretty much jump to the current, the way that it is right now and the way that we believe that uh, it should be, really, you could jump to the level of force, the minimum level of force that you need to uh, control the situation. So that's the way it's written. Uh, but if you write exhaust all alternatives before shooting, the officer does not, we believe that the officer does not have enough time to think about all the different alternatives and to go through them one by one. You just kind of have to jump to what you need to do. Um, and that's the recommendation. Next one is uh, require, require comprehensive reporting. It's already in the policy that um, the difference is uh, they, they can't wait, says that Officers need to require, need to report every time they use force or threaten to use force. I had a problem with threatening to use force, uh, writing a paper every single time you threaten because anything is really threat to threaten to use force. I mean, that can, could be really anything. If you, if you tell someone, if I don't, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to have to use force and of course, um, you don't need to write a report based on that because they probably have to do it all the time. So the way it's written right now is good if, if 
uh, and they actually added additional things to the uh, up, to the updated policy. Um, if an if, uh, if someone else alleges, if an individual alleges that unreasonable force was used, then they have to report on that as well. So right now, in, in addition to this, anytime that they actually use force, they have to report um, that. So we believe that the updated policy is good one that they're uh, potentially going to adopt. And those are the, uh, then that's an update of what we have. Uh, we're still continuing to have additional meetings. This could change. So this is the update as of right now. Any questions to this while I still have it up? Well, I'd, I'd like to just add something, Scott. Um, first of all, I think we can all recognize that Scott has done a fantastic job at looking in a granular way at the policy as it exists and, and what we recommend. Um, and as he mentioned at the beginning, we took a very thoughtful look at this, um, listening to the community and to our first responders. But we also looked at what the liability implications were if we were to move from the suggested policies from Lexapol into a local agency policy, as well as what case law and how that impacts how the policies are written. So it's a comprehensive look at all of that, not just the specific wording of each of these of, of each of these suggestions. And then the final thing is, is that looking at it, the one thing that was encouraging was how close we were to the eight can't wait recommendations to begin with. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that this isn't just about reading the text. It's about looking at the context of how that actually works in the real world as well. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll echo that, that this is a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of meetings that um, Scott put into this and, and Ed, and um, it's a great product. And we're not going to be meeting um, in October, but we will be meeting again in November. And we hope that we have another meeting um, with, uh, I, I believe, with the police department um, this week to talk about um, some of the proposed uh, recommendations and reforms. And so we hope that in November, um, we will have uh, recommendations for the city council with regard to police department um, uh, reform changes, you know, uh, improvements, thing, things, things like that. So um, anyone have questions or comments on Scott's presentation or the overall police reform process, Dr. Schneider? <laughs> Well, I want to thank Scott and the other members of the subcommittee for working on this. I do have some problem with uh, some of the wording. Uh, both in, in two of the recommendations, you use the word fleeing, like a fleeing subject, I, I suspect, I mean, on foot, I assume, and also a, f a fleeing vehicle. I mean, I can't understand how can you uh, have to shoot uh, at a fleeing suspect on foot? I mean, that's one thing I don't understand. Now, uh, a moving vehicle, if it was coming right at you or right at a pedestrian or something of that sort, you might want to shoot. But if it was driving away from you, why would you shoot at a, move, a, a fleeing vehicle? Um, yeah. Um, Scott, do you want me to answer? Or? Um, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, this came up too. And um, I think it was, it was really important to meet with the police department and the police officers association because this really helped to educate us. And so some of the examples were, and these are all extreme examples and every every example has a, you know, if you change the fact that you will change the outcome. But two particular things came up with regard to moving vehicles is in Europe, there had been cases of people using, uh, and, and even in the United States, there have been cases of people using a vehicle as a weapon. So if, you know, someone is using a vehicle as a weapon, um, that is one extreme circumstance where shooting at that vehicle may be necessary to prevent further loss of life and injury, um, regardless of where that vehicle is, is presently located or where it's going. And I think the other one was, it's actually, um, it's case law, a legal case law with regard to shooting at someone that's fleeing is, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so don't, don't quote me on this, but I think the general gist of it is, if you have an active shooter situation where someone has already shot or threatened to shoot or use deadly force against people and maybe proceed, maybe going to another location to additionally do this, but not just 
someone's fleeing, so I'm authorized to shoot at them. It's really, it's a continuing and ongoing threat. And that action by officers is what will prevent further loss of life or serious bodily injury. Um, those were kind of the more extreme situations that were brought up to us by the police department in, in those recommendations. Yeah, Dr. Schneider. Yeah, I understand those situations. I think those are correct. You know, the things you cited, you know, if the vehicle is being driven at people or at the officer or something like that, or if a, an active shooter is, is fleeing, but an unarmed person or something, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be shooting at them. The other thing is about the threat of force. I know some police departments are saying an officer has to report whenever they um, unholster their weapon, not just threaten use of force, but unholster their weapon, bring their weapon out. And, and, and that might be a, um, something to consider. Reading that. I think that is part of the current SQPC policy from what we gathered. I think that what Scott was saying with regard to threat is where is that line drawn? If, if someone puts their hand on their weapon, is that reportable? Or only if they draw their weapon, is that reportable? Um, I think currently, if you point your weapon at someone and have it drawn and point your weapon at someone, that is something that is captured. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think that I think that has to be defined. Yeah, it is defined. It's it's specific in the uh, policy right now. If an officer points a firearm at any person, uh, they do have to report. Uh, where did you see, Doctor Snyder? Where did you see? Uh, you were talking about a recommendation regarding fleeing. I, did I put something in there regarding shooting at a fleeing person or vehicle? Yeah, there, there were two, two sides. One was, I think, on slide number four and then on slide number seven or eight. Let me pull it up again. Uh, uh, Mayor Proham, do you have something? I saw you flash up. Yeah, um, this is just a follow up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, provide an update on AB 1196. This is the bill that was pending in the state legislature that would prohibit a law enforcement agency from authorizing use of a carotid restraint or chokehold. Um, when we last met, the bill was still pending. It was passed by the legislature. So essentially, unless it is vetoed by Governor Newsom um, on or before September 30th, it will become law. And I um, greatly doubt that um, he will veto it. So I just wanted to provide that follow up. Thank you. Um, any other questions about this? So I would like to, um, at our next meeting in, in November, um, to have formalized our recommendations by then and be and presented their um, uh, recommendations from the Public Safety Commission. So. Um, why, why are we skipping October? Is there something, what's happening? We normally skip October. We can have a special meeting if you feel that's necessary, but um, we, Skip October because I'm meeting actually falls council as soon as possible since I'm leaving office in December. Okay, we can call for a, a, a special meeting. Um, so can yeah. we can we ask staff uh, what everyone's availability is because our normally scheduled meeting is actually on um, Columbus Day, so um, it's a federal holiday. That's that's kind of why we stay dark in October. Mm -hmm. But if you can find us a suitable time around that time period, we can have a meeting in October. Um, a special meeting since uh, that will be in addition to our regular meeting schedule. Thank you, Dr. Snyder, for bringing that up. I, know I think it'd be, of, oh, oh I, I just wanted to add, I, I think it would be very helpful to have Dr. Schneider's continued participation since there's a lot of, there's a lot of balls up in the air and, and um, you don't want to start from scratch with the new council. Okay. So let's plan to meet in October for presentation of recommendations. I was going to say, I think two of us are termed out in December and uh, the soon to be retired councilman could be appointed to the next. Uh, hey, don't make any suggestions. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, we're running short on time because I have another meeting. So uh, can I propose that we put um, sections, uh, agenda items one, two and three to the next meeting um, and maybe just have a real quick update under staff liaison from Chief Riddle about the COVID-19 um, updates uh, or our subcommittee. But um, I actually think that for, for agenda item number two, I already saw it's on the council agenda. Um, so 
the commissioners can just read it. And if you have any questions, you can email the chief. I don't think it's anything that we need to comment or endorse on. So um, I guess I'll just recommend um, an abbreviated discussion on agenda item three, uh, removing um, item number two for just, you know, read yourself kind of thing. And it's available on, on, on the agenda packet for um, the community members that want to look at it. And then we can push the approval of the minutes to the next meeting and we can just go to council liaison and uh, communications. Any objections to that? I think we can approve the minutes. Okay, M make the motion. <laughs> Sounds like the only uh, item that uh, we'd want to hold over to the next meeting it would just be the uh, COVID-19 subcommittee report. Correct. Yeah. Which is kind of a static update anyways. Yeah. So um, would you like to uh, make a motion to approve the minutes for agenda item one? Motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Any second? A second. All right. Uh, Alan made the motion. Uh, Ed seconded it. Uh, all in favor? Uh, say aye. 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 Um, Amin, do you uh, abstain? Okay. I'm abstaining because I wasn't at that meeting. So uh, Amin will abstain. Everyone else has voted to uh, pass the minutes for August 10th, 2020. So can we go to uh, council leave on communications, Dr. Snyder? Um, I have nothing further to report. Okay. Um, staff liaison? Oh, one thing, you know, it was already mentioned, but the city manager did resign last week. Oh, yes. And so we, uh, Paul Riddle is our acting city manager. Well, we thank you, Chief Riddle, for taking on this duty. Uh, I don't know if you actually had a choice in the matter, but we appreciate your your, your service. <laughs> And if you have a staff update for us, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, uh, thank you. And it, it's an honor, it really is. Um, just, I'll be very brief and I'll just focus on the brush fires as we get asked about that quite frequently. Um, our fire crews have been assigned now for pretty much 30 straight days. Um, we've responded to over 12 fires throughout the state. Uh, we've traveled over 1,500 miles to get to those fires. And currently our engine with four personnel has been um, they were demobbed yesterday from the El Dorado fire on an emergency basis to get to the Bobcat fire in Monrovia as that fire is being extremely stubborn and um, with some expected winds, they want to they get a handle on that with, with the fact that Monrovia, Sierra Madre and Arcadia and parts of Pasadena are still threatened. So um, that's just a quick update on, on our deployments. And we also have a fire recruitment going in which we received 60 applications. So we will be um, proceeding with um, recruitment to fill one vacancy currently with some projected retirements next year. And that concludes my report. How are, how are the firefighters doing? They're, they're okay? Um, they're coping with the fatigue and all that? Yeah, you know, this is, um, we've, we've been able to rotate crews, but I can say that morale, if, if, if there's one way to improve morale in the fire service is give them a few fires to go to. They, they really enjoy it. Um, this is what they've trained for. Um, you know, it's, it's impactful to, to staffing, but I can say that they just show up each and every shift with smiles on their face and they're doing a great job. Um, and again, if the question comes up, these, the cost of all these fires are 100% reimbursable to the city with an additional administrative fee that goes on top of it. So the city actually comes out a little ahead on these deployments, um, but morale remains very high. What about the wear and tear on your vehicles? That's part of the um, administrative fee, but I can tell you if you know anything about a diesel engine, driving around uh, town, um, actually diesel engines don't like that. So to get them out on a freeway and let them, and let them open up for three or 400 miles, it, it actually does wonders for the diesel engine. So. Um, again, diesel engines are kind of tracked at an hourly, not really the miles. The miles don't mean much. So um, although there is some wear and tear to the brakes and things, it doesn't uh, increase our cost too much from our normal vehicle maintenance cost. Um, Chief, I know last week in the extreme heat, we had the War Memorial open as a cooling center. Has there been any thought to um, open it again as a, a sort of clean air center? Um, I've had a brief conversation with Sheila Pouch as to, um, th that was the first I heard of that request was late last week. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't had any additional discussions with Sheila as to the feasibility of that with staffing. Um, 
So I really can't provide you know any additional to that at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief Riddle. Um, I, I will mention that um, I am um, pursuing a discussion with the LA County Public Health to see whether or not it's possible for the city to reopen its library. And um, it's not clear from the governor's order, from the combination of the governor's most recent order, as well as the um, county public health officer's order, whether or not we can do that. It's not something that I understand we would be able to do really soon, but um, I am um, hoping to obtain clarification of our ability to, to do so, because I think it would solve a number of problems in the city. Oh, you mean open the library like for business or for cooling or clean air shelter? For cooling, clean air, perhaps a quiet area for students to study. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Chief Ortiz? Oh, sorry, Alan, do you have something? Yeah, Morning. just a quick question for Chief Riddle. Uh, all in our packets uh, this month, there was a a uh, summary of a uh, recap of the COVID-19 costs that we hope to be reimbursed for. Yes. Um, I would just like to check, how are you keeping track of those costs? Because uh, I know just from looking through the warrants in the council packets that not everything seems to get labeled as a COVID-19 expense. So these expenses are tracked. Um, each department is responsible to anything that they think has a nexus uh, for reimbursement for COVID related. Um, and that would include preparation, response and recovery to submit those um, expenses onto a, a shared Excel sheet, so to speak. And then our grant analysts and our point person for the city who's submitting these reports cross checks to make sure they are within the parameters of, of the reimbursement themselves, what's been identified. So some of the things that we submit may not qualify for reimbursement and those restrictions kind of um, um, get tightened up a little bit, especially on the federal side. So what I submitted with the packet was where we are at right now. Um, and next meeting, I could provide a more detailed, um, the report went out, the first request to the CARES Act for, went out simultaneously as I had this information. So this is what we had at the time. And so with the CARES Act, which is uh, state funds, um, we were limited to 314,333. We reached that ceiling relatively quick. Um, so that, that has been submitted already to um, the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, we took some of those funds that, were, um, it, that would be over that and we, we made sure they would fit into either the FEMA side or the um, AB 2766 side. So our total reimbursements at this point are $487,308. Um, and again, talking to and, and looking at everything, that's pretty close, um, quite honestly, to what our total charges are. Um, you know, most cities are still looking, they would have wished we would have got more reimbursement for staff time. But, um, you know, that's, that's where we're at right now with the parameters set by the reimbursement. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Chief Ortiz, Police Department. Real quick, thank you, Chair Dean. Um, the PD has been on tactical alert on and off like the last three weeks due to civil unrest. Uh, Pasadena has reached out several times um, as things escalate pretty quick over there. Most recently, as of the last 24 hours, they've had seven overdoses, three ending in deaths, two shootings and a stabbing. So it's right on our border. Uh, we want to be aware of um, crime or is around us. Uh, please don't hesitate to call. Um, you're never a bother. Uh, you see something, say something. Uh, and lastly, our, our folks are, are, uh, are healthy. Uh, morale is good in the department. Um, the deputy chief and I have some training um, coming up on Thursday uh, in regards to civil unrest, dealing with uh, deployments, uh, platoon formations, uh, and a management level. Uh, eventually, we'll get to uh, frontline responders and our department personnel will be um, updated in first aid this week also. So that's just a short update. 
The chief, don't we have something at uh, at one o'clock tomorrow? We do. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chief for keys. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Commissioner Communications. Um, uh, Amin, do you have anything? Uh, I don't have anything to add this week or this month. Um, Scott? Nothing additional. Uh, Grace? Uh, the only update is that school's been in session for a month and it continues to be distance learning. Uh, Alan? Nothing. Nothing for me. All right. Well, it's 1023. Um, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today. And um, I will follow up with an email to staff to try to schedule um, a meeting sometime during the week of October 12th. Uh, October 12th will be a regularly scheduled meeting, so sometime during that week or around there, if you guys can follow up with uh, availability for a meeting. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.